Good evening. Today we're going to look at the book, The Symbolisms of Heraldry. Now when we look at old crests and old emblems from Europe, we have to notice that they're portraying certain images of different animals, some mystic, some not. But what are they saying? We know that the King James Version of the Bible has many verses with the unicorn. But what is the meaning of unicorn? Some might say it's a one-horned horse, but there's another meaning to it. So we're going to look up the word heraldry. Heraldry is a discipline relating to the design, display, and study of armorial bearings, known as armory, as well as related disciplines such as vexology together with the study of ceremony, rank, and pedigree. Armory, the best known branch of heraldry, concerns the designs and transmission of the heraldic achievement. The achievement or armorial bearings usually includes a coat of arms on a shield, helmet, and crest together with any accomplishing devices such as supporters, badges, heraldic banners, and mottos. So when we read the book, The Symbolisms of Heraldry, it reads, we read of the lion born as an ensign of the tribe of Judah. So we had to ask ourselves, why do these European countries have the lion or the tribe of Judah? Could it be that they could trace their ancestry to the ancient Israel or that they knew that they were the people of the book or the people of the scriptures? When we look at the scriptures, we know that Judah had two sons, Sariah and Perez, Perez being the house of David, through which uh, Yeshua or Yahawashai came through the bloodline, and Zerah, that being of the ancient or ancestors of the Trojans, Brutus, and early British royal lines. That's why we see the um, heraldry of the lions, the lion or the tribe of Judah, and these were so-called black people. So the lion is a common charge in heraldry. It traditionally symbolizes courage, nobility, royalty, strength, stateness, and value because historically the lion has been regarded as the king of beasts. The lion also carries Judeo-Christian symbolism. And we know the scriptures and the Bible is not about religion. That's just some nonsense that they put in there to the uh, modern uh, people who go by the Christian doctrine and so forth. But the people of the book, the medieval times, the dark ages, they could trace their ancestors through their bloodline, ancient Israel. The Lion of Judah stands in the coat of arms of Jerusalem. Similar looking lions can be found elsewhere, such as in the coat of arms, Swedish royal house of Bilbo. From there, in turn, derived into the coat of arms of Finland, formerly belonging to Sweden. So right here we have the royal coat of arms of Great Britain, a.k.a. the land of the covenant. The coming together of England slash the Angles, Ireland, land of the Gauls, Scotland, land of the Scots, Wales, land of the Welsh, all various Israelite tribes, which all came together in 1603 under King James. Yes, the King James Bible. And yes, King James the sixth. The first of England, 1567 through 1625, was a so-called black man, ruled for 343 years. We have to remember that the Stuarts not only ruled in Scotland, they ruled in France, Spain, Ireland, and England, Britain, and the Wales. King James was able to rule all these lands because all of these people were Iberian, black, or Negro descent. They all were the same people, the same phenotype or stock. So right here we have the gold lion, which is in the pose of the rampant, which means to attack. And also this is the lion of Judah. As we can see, the flag, which is the cross, the red cross, this is England. And the lion's head is facing towards the viewer. This means he's in attack mode. So basically it's the rampant regardant. And this gold lion is for the son of Perez, the Lion of Judah. So right here we have the unicorn, or the kingdom of Joseph, so that's Ephraim. And the horn represents rulership. And the flag above the unicorn is Scotland. Now where we see in defense, 
we see the red line, which is for Scotland. The red line is for Scotland. The red line is because the Scots believe themselves to be the direct descendants of Judah's other son, Zerah. And when we see the gold harp of Ireland, they trace that through Zerah, the Malaysian kings, Troy or the Trojans. The gold harp is for the kings of Ireland. And again, the unicorn is associated with the northern kingdom, Ephraim and Joseph, the kingdom of Israel. The symbol of the unicorn, the real meaning, is the two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. And the real symbol of the unicorn is a rhinoceros. So the etymology of words, rhinoceros, ungainly quadruped, having tough, thick skin, and usually one or two horns on the snout, once widespread but now limited to Africa and South Asia. Rhinoceros, also a horned beast, sometimes regarded as a species of unicorn. So logically speaking, when we see these crests or we see these heraldry symbols, you know, these people came from quote unquote Northern Africa. Okay. They could trace their lineage through ancient Israel. These are not Caucasians. So when we think of the lion, we think of Africa. And when we think of the unicorn slash rhino, it also denotes to Africa. These ancient crests or these heraldry were not talking about Caucasians. These were our ancestors that could trace their lineage through ancient Israel. They knew who they were in the flesh, according to the scriptures. I'm also going to be reading from this book, The Negro Rulers of Scotland and the British Isles. Okay. Start off right here. Now, I said that the, um, the Israelites were in captivity. Okay. I think it's first, no, second Kings 18, 11, and 13. But it says the tribe of Judah originated with Judah and his two Negris Canaanite wives, uh, Bashuma, Bashuma, and Tamar. Excuse me if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Okay. For centuries, the hybrid Judites intermingled their blood with every other Hebrew tribe, which in turn intermixed with the Negro nations of Ethiopia, Egypt, Put, and Canaan, where the two people became a blend of one people. The same mongrel people from Africa and Eastern nations migrated to Scotland, the British Isles, and the rest of Europe, etc., under the single name Moor, meaning black or Negro. Okay, as stated in the prophet Edris, um, I think it was uh, Edris 12 and uh, 40 through 50, the uh, 10 lost tribes, and then also in um, 2 Kings. Um, 18, 11, and 13. Okay. Um, the Moorish uh, Negro stewards of Scotland and England, who are the descendants of Kenneth the Niger, claim their lineage to go all the way back to the tribe of Judah, a tribe that was created by the hybrid Judah and his two Negro Canaanite wives. Okay. So they can trace their genealogy, their lineage. Okay, the migration, the slavery, etc. The Scottish historian McRitchie, which the book I just read in his book called Ancient and Modern Britons, Volume 2. Well, I have Volume 2, but I read from Volume 1. Commented that the first Britons were black in complexion. So now we're going to read Acts chapter 29, verse 1 through 3. And Paul, full of the blessings of Hamishiach and abounding in the spirit, departed out of Rome determining to go into Spain, for he had a long time proposed to journey there ward, and was minded also to go from hence to Britain. Verse 2, For he had heard in Phoenicia that a certain of the children of Israel about the time of the Assyrian captivity had escaped by sea to the isles afar off, as spoken be the prophet Ezra, and called by the Romans Britain. Verse 3, and the Lord commanded the gospel to be preached far hence to the Gentiles and to the lost sheep house of Israel. So now we're going to skip to verse 7. And they departed out of Spain, and Paul and his company, finding a ship in Aramica, sailing unto Britain, they were therein, 
and passing along the south coast, they reached a port called Rampinus. And when it was voiced abroad that the apostle had landed on their coast, great multitudes of the inhabitants met him, and they treated Paul courteously, and he entered in at the east gate of their city and lodged in the house of a Hebrew and one of his own nation. Now we know, according to the scriptures, Romans 11 and 1, I believe, Paul was a Benjamite. He was a quote-unquote Jew of the southern kingdom. So now we're going to skip down to verse 13 and 14. And it came to pass that certain of the Druids came unto Paul privately and showed by their rites and ceremonies they were descended from the Jews or Judah, which escaped from bondage in the land of Egypt. And the apostle believed these things, and he gave them the kiss of peace. Verse 14, And Paul abode in his lodgings three months, confirming in the faith and preaching Hamishiach continually. So now we're going to go to Genesis chapter 38, Judah and Tamar. You can also find this in First Chronicles chapter 2, 3 through 12. And it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned into a certain Adulamite, whose name was Hara. And Judah saw there was a daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua. And he took her and went into her, which means they had intercourse. And she conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Ur. And she conceived again and bare a son. She called his name Owen. And she yet again conceived and bare a son, and called his name Salah. And he was at Chesib when she bare him. And now we're at First Chronicles chapter 2, verse 3. Descendants of Judah. The sons of Judah, Ur and Onan and Salah, which were three born unto him of the daughter of Shula the Canaanitess. And Ur, the firstborn of Judah, was evil in the sight of the Most High, as we read previously. And he killed him. And Tamar, his daughter-in-law, bare him Perez and Zerah. All the sons of Judah were five. So now we're back at Genesis chapter 38, the birth of Perez and Zerah, verse 27. And it came to pass in the time of her travail that, behold, twins were in her womb. And it came to pass when she travailed that one put out his hand and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread saying this came out first and it came to pass as he drew back his hand that behold his brother came out and she said how hast thou broken forth this breach be upon thee therefore his name was called perez and afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand and his name was called zarah so we see that zarah was supposed to have the birthright because he had the red scarlet thread. But Perez came out first and pushed through. So we know that the firstborn has the birthright. That being Perez, the gold lion, the house of David. And Zerah, the red scarf thread. Which represents the red lion. Which also represents the lion of Judah. Also to take in consideration in Matthew 20 16. The Hamishiach said, so the last shall be first. And the first last, for many be called, but few chosen. So Perez was supposed to be second, but he came out first. And Zerah was supposed to be the firstborn with a red scarf thread, but he came out second. The Celts, the Brits, the Saxons, they were all people of color. Macy, in his book called A Book of the Beginnings, Volume 1, attributes the earliest Europeans to have been of black races. So now we're going to go to this book, The Negro Question, Part 6, The 13 Black Colonies by Lee Cumming. So now we're on page 28, Judah, Daria, the founders of Troy. With these things in mind, let us now turn to Darda, a descendant of Zaria, who once resided in Egypt. In the authorized version of the Old Testament, his name is spelled Daria, but in the margin, the alternate spelling is Darda. And the Jewish historian Josephus calls him Darninius. This is significant because the group which he led went northward across the Mediterranean Sea to the northwest corner of Asia Minor, ancient Antolia. There, under the rule of Darda, 
Dardanians, they established a kingdom later called Troy on the southern shore of that narrow body of water which bears his name to this day, Darnells. Hundreds of years later, this kingdom was destroyed in a war with the Greeks. Some of the survivors fled northward into Europe where their emblem, the rampant red lion, appears on the arms of some of the nations. Right here we have another red lion. And it says the royal banner of Scotland, also known as the lion rampant, the banner of the old arms of the king of Scots. It consists of a lion contained within a treasure flory counter flory in heraldic terminology. It is blazoned as or a lion rampant. In its states, King James VI of Scotland traces his lineage back to the Judean Brutus of Troy, Phrygia. The people of Troy, Phrygia were present on the day of Pentecost. Peter said that they were Jews or Judeans. And so did the Jewish historian Josephus. The seed of David is spelled in ancient Anatolia as Hadas, if I'm pronouncing it right. But in the Bible, 1 Chronicles 3 and 22, Nehemiah 10 and 4, and Ezra 8 and 2, the son of David's name is spelled Hadas. What are the odds that the son of David's name, Hattusa, would appear on a map of ancient Troy, Phrygia, or modern Turkey? This is where Brutus came from, where the Phrygias and paleo hebrew writings were found. Salathiel is the bridge Ezra's 3 and 2 and Matthew 1 and 12 that ties the kings of Judah to Yahawashai or Yeshua or Jesus after the Babylonian captivity. Brutus is the bridge that ties the Stuart kings to the royal house of Judah after the Roman captivity. Without Brutus, the royal house of Judah would be lost. So now we're on page 25, chapter 2, Zariah and Calico in Europe. If the kings of Scotland, Ireland, and Britain are truly descendants of Judah, how did they arrive in Europe? This is a question that must be answered to validate the Hebrew claims of Scottish kings. In order to solve the riddle, we have to follow the footsteps of Judah's two grandsons, Calco and Daria. From 1 Chronicles chapter 2, 1 through 6, according to the ancient historian Josephus, Calco left Egypt and founded the city of Athens, but had to return to Egypt after killing a man. After assisting one of the pharaohs in his fight against the Ethiopians, Galagus, son of Calco, was given the hand of the pharaoh's daughter, Skoda, in marriage. After living seven years in Egypt, Galagus fled the land at the outset of the plagues and traveled westward to Spain. This is the reason why the effigy of Charles I and the wording Mundi Calco is extremely significant. During their time in Spain, Galagus and his people founded a city which still bears the name of their ancestor Zara, Zaragoza. Wherever they traveled, they left this name like a footprint marking their journey to the distant lands. Thus, the river on the banks of which they founded the city of Zaragoza is still to this day called the Ebro, and the land itself they gave the name Iberia, the land of the Hiberia or Hebrews. After residing for some time in Spain, Galactius died and his widow, Skoda, along with her sons Judah, left the land and voyaged northward to Ireland. Once again, they took their name with them, calling their new home Hiberland or Hibernia and the islands to the north of it, the Hybrids or Hebrews. Then with Itaman as their king, these descendants of Zara, Judah, founded the kingdom of Ulster shortly after the exodus. From that time until now, the emblem of Ulster has been a red hand circled with a scarlet cord. If you have time, read Joshua chapter 2, 17 through 21, and you will see that Zara's sons gave the harlot Rahab a scarlet thread to place over her home as a sign of protection. This is how I knew that the spies that entered Jericho were the sons of Zerah, the scarlet thread. In the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 17, excuse me, Joshua chapter 7, 17 through 18, the name of Zabidi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah is mentioned. This is the Hebrew version of Zebedee, Matthew 4 and 21 from the book of Matthew. This means that the Zebedee boys 
or Jews from the lineage of Zerah. The original black Scots and Irish are of the same people. This can be a bit confusing. I had to look at the data of these two grandsons of Judah for at least one week before I realized I was looking at two different migrations of the tribe of Judah to Europe. The hybrids are the Hebrews, plain and simple. The so-called scholars know this, and if they don't, they should. So I have this book right here, Hebrewisms of West Africa by Joseph J. Williams. Anglo-Saxons. Towards the middle of the last century, our Israelitist origin by John Wilson revived the old controversy in an effort to derive the Anglo-Saxon race from the oppressed by Israel, Egypt, and Assyria. They finally left Canaan and settled in Ireland. Right here we have the book, Origin of the Anglo-Saxon Race, a study of the settlement of England and the tribal origin of the old English people by Thomas William Shore. This was a um, so-called white man or a Caucasian. And this is what he states. There is another old word used by the Anglo-Saxons to denote black or brown black, the word swart. The personal names suit or suit may have been derived from this word and may have originally denoted people of a dark brown or black complexion. Having the black was the name of a king of Norway who died in 863. The so-called black men, I repeat, the so-called black men of the Anglo-Saxon period probably included some of the darker Windish people among them. Immigrants or descendants of people of the same race or phenotype as the ancestors of the Sorbs or uh, Lothria, pronouncing that right, on the borders of Saxony and Prussia at the present day. Some of the darker winds may well have been among the black Vikings uh, referred to in the Irish annals as well as in those of Wales and may have been the people who have left the Anglo-Saxon name Black Man Bird, which occurs in one of the charters. Right here, page 21. The typical Saxon skull was dolichocephalic or long, the breadth not exceeding four-fifths of the length, like those of all the nations of the Gothic stock. Goths, Norwegians, Swedes, Danes, Angles, and Saxons among the ancient nations all had this general head form as shown by the remains of these several races or seed lines which have been found and from the head form of the modern nations descended from them. So when we look at this chart, we see the ancient races or the Shemitic stock in Europe with the dolichocephalic, you know, head skulls and whatnot. Migrated as Europe as the black Celts, the Goths, which were people of color. As we read in this book, the Saxons, which were a brunette, swarthy people, dark complexion, the black Irish, the black Scots, the Danes, which were descendants of the tribe of Dan and so forth. These were so-called black people or Negroes. That's why we have the Welsh, we have different names, not from slave masters, but our ancestors came from these lands and so forth. So right here we have the Negro question part four, the missing link by Lee Cummings. So we're on page 107, Benjamin Franklin, title America as a land of opportunity, 1751. Why should the Palestine Moors which means Negro or so-called black slash Germans be suffered to swarm in our settlements. They will never adopt our customs any more than they can adopt our complexion, white skin. All of Africa, Asia, and American except for us are black. Russia, Italy, Spain, France, Swedes, and the Germans are black. Okay. This was the old world order. And when you have this dolichocephalic, when you have this skull, that is a Semitic skull. Okay. So now we're on page seven. 
The anthropological evidence is also of two kinds. The evidence of human remains, chiefly skulls from Anglo-Saxon burial places, and that of similar remains of the same period from old cemeteries on the continent. The racial characters of people in various parts of Northern Europe and in parts of England at the present time. Now we're on page eight. The Anglo-Saxon settlers, in some instances, called their neighbors in the next settlement, and if they were of a different tribe by the tribal name to which they belonged, or one expressive of the sense of strangers or foreigners. Also to take into consideration, the Israelites were called strangers or foreigners. We know that the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom split, so there was a rift between the two kingdoms, different customs, and so forth. There was animosity or civil war. This consideration of a probable origin of the great proportion of brunettes, which means complexion, brown complexion of the face, in the two of the south mainland counties of England leads us to that of color names as surnames and place names, which may probably have been derived from their original sellers. For example, there is a common name, Brown. This has been derived from the Anglo-Saxon brawn, signifying brown. It is not reasonable to doubt that when our forefathers called a man brawn or brown, they gave him this name as descriptive of his brown complexion. The probability that the brunettes were common is supported by the frequent references to persons named Braun in Anglo-Saxon literature. So I'm going to read this article and I want you to follow along with me to understand the psyche of how they've, you know, used the slave narrative in their advantage and try to make us believe that um, these names come from them when all in actuality they have our surnames. So the surname origin, English, Scottish, Irish, alternate surname spellings, Brown, Braun, Brown, uh, Bruin, Brun, Braun, Brun, uh, Bruni, and Braun. Brown is the second most common surname among so-called African Americans in the United States. Some formerly enslaved people adopted the name Brown following the Civil War for the obvious reasons that it described their appearance. However, there were also many who adopted the surname in honor of the North American 19th century black activist, Durham Brown. See how they always want to use the slave narrative to their advantage? Now we're at the American Dictionary of English Language, 1828 Webster's Dictionary. Now when we go to the word brunette, what do we see? Brown. A woman with a brown or dark complexion, complexion of the face or skin. So now we go to complexion, the color of the skin, brunette, particularly of the face, the color of the external parts of the body, excuse me, of a body or a thing. As a fair complexion, the dark complexion, the complexion of the sky, the temperament, habitude or natural deposition of the body. So this is the natural deposition of the body. Melanin, okay? Or brown or swarthy or so forth. But when they say brunette, they're not talking about hair. Okay, they're talking about people of color. Negroid, Africoid, whatever you want to call it, people. Dr. Wild would have it that at this time of the Babylonian captivity after the prophet Jeremiah was carried into Egypt by the remnant of the people. He escaped thence to Northern Ireland, taking with him the Ark of the Covenant, Jacob's pillow, the stone of Israel, as well as the daughter of Asetius, if I'm pronouncing it right, through whom the royal line was to continue. Irish histories, he tells us, some 20 of which we find agree say that about 585 B.C., a divine man landed in Ulster, having with him the king's daughter, Stone of Destiny, and the Ark, and many other wonderful things. The people of 
Ulster of Dan understood the old adventurer. In passing, the author assures us now at Terah, Jeremiah buried the Ark of the Covenant, tables of the law, etc. As to the presence of the tribe of Dan in Ulster, the matter is easily explained according to Dr. Wilde's way of thinking. During the persecution of Ahab, thousands of them left Palestine, settling in Denmark. This word Denmark means the circle of Dan. In course of time, they crossed the red. In course of time, they crossed the sea and took possession of the north of Ireland, settling the providence of Ulster. Thus, we have a dual race of Irishmen, the Philistines in the south, and God's chosen people in the north. Consequently, it is easy for Dr. Wilde to explain what must appeal to him as the inferiority complex of the South, which readily fell a prey to the allurements of Rome. Furthermore, according to Dr. Wilde, Jeremiah's is the real St. Patrick, simply the patriarchal saint, which became the St. Patriarch, then St. Patrick. The Roman Church introduced St. Patrick to offset the St. Patriarch. However, the doctor admits that the individual commonly revered as the patreon of Ireland was more than a mythical person. He gives his real name as Copernicus and would have him born 387 AD near the present city of uh, Balon, if I'm pronouncing that right. Further, he is satisfied that this Copernicus was himself a Jew belonging to the tribe of Benjamin. For the Benjamites began to fill in that part of France about this period. It is proved that the British are Israelites. The whole history of England will be understood with the right point of view. And that is that the Most High's dealings with her, being Israel, show forth that he is true, faithful, and covenant-keeping. This is the true secret of England's greatness and not any inherent goodness that rests in her or in her people. Okay, so we know from David McRitchie's book, Ancient and Modern Britons, that the original inhabitants or the people who settled there were people of color, swarthy, tiny. Okay, that's why you've seen that chart in the beginning of the video. Because a lot of us were known as... Uh, the original Saxons, old Saxons, the Celts, the uh, Druids, Druids, um, and so forth. Okay. We settled there first. Most people associate Europe with white skin. That's not the case. Okay. That's why King James the Six, so forth, and many other great kings of Europe or the British Isles were men of color. Right here, Origins on the Symbolism of Heraldry. This is from my book. I'm just going to read one page. If all the information on the origins of the surname Wade, which is my last name, comes from England, the original Saxons, the first inhabitants of the Isles were people of color, of course, and black people. In ancient times, we were described as swarthy, tawny, copper-coated peoples as well as tribal and regional names throughout centuries. Our names changed, but some of our people knew that we were descendants of the nation of Israel or the children of Israel. Through uh, heraldry, the symbolism is the image and the colors have a meaning along with the images to express the lineage and nationality. That's why we see certain colors, blue, gold, red, you know, etc. <clears throat> Colors have symbolic meanings and definitions. For example, the color blue means loyalty and truth. As the commemoration to the Most High to remember his law and statutes, the children of Israel, Numbers 15, 38, wore fringes of blue throughout generations on the corners of their garments. Yellow or gold is generosity and elevation of the mind. Okay. Line of Judah. The royal line. All right. All right, this one is real interesting right here. <clears throat> Who are the saints? The fleur de lis in French, the lily flower, 
is used in heraldry as a decorative uh, design or symbol. It's been used over centuries while it has negative connotations with uh, association to slavery. The other side has biblical elements. We are all aware of the New Orleans Saints logo, Florida Lease, but what does it mean symbolically? Let's see. As I mentioned earlier in this book, the original inhabitants of Europe were Negroid, the Grimondi race. Negroes in the Paleolithic age, including areas of Austria, southern France, and Palestine. So we see the Florida Lease flower is associated with France. We occupied these lands and regions first. Like J. Rogers' title of his book, Nature Has No Color Lines, and people of color are not just from the regions of Africa, we have to ask ourselves, why would a European coat of arms have lines on their emblems? They could trace their lineage through the tribe of Judah, and when the tribes migrated to Europe and different regions, in the, you know, that mixture, enslaved, and so forth, We must remember the descendants of the children of Israel are scattered throughout the four corners of the earth. Now, if we know a little history, that in 1719 through 1743, there were certain slaves that came from Africa and brought to Louisiana. The book Creole New Orleans Race and Americanization has information who these certain slaves were, Judites or Judeans, from the slave coast of the kingdom of Judah, from that map. Um... Right here, Negro land. And as you can see, Kingdom of Judah. This is a real map. Okay. Um, let me see where I left off at. Strange how the book has the emblem of the floor, the lease flower. Okay. As we can see right here, Creole New Orleans, race and Americanization. Right here, the floor, the lease. Okay, just like the uh, New Orleans Saints logo. Okay. Judah would be taken into captivity. Limitations 1 and 3. Judah is gone into captivity. She, meaning Israel, metaphor, dwelleth among the heathen. She findeth no rest. Who are the saints based in biblical knowledge and history, based on the context of the scriptures? We look into the book of Psalms 148 and 14. He, the Most High God, exalted the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, of the children of Israel, a people near to him, not the whole world. Okay. In Deuteronomy 33, 1 through 2, clearly the saints are the Shemitic and Negro Israelites of the scriptures, the ones who received the covenant with Moses, the children of Israel, and they received it on the Mount Sinai, where the Most High was. <clears throat> And rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth out of uh, Paran and came with ten thousand of saints, the Israelites, um, from his right hand and went a fiery law for them. So basically, I have right here the symbolism of heraldry. Okay. William Cecil Wade. All right. And just to uh, clarify what I was talking about with the lion. You know, you wonder why all these European countries have those lines on them right here. We read of the lion and boar as an ensign of the tribe of Judah, the eagle of the Romans, the two-headed eagle of the east, still bore by two great European empires. And we know that we ruled Europe during those times, the two black-headed eagle. Of the white horse of Woden, borne by uh, Hengist when he invaded Britain, which the shield of Hanover still bears, of the raven bore by the ancient Danes. And we know that the ancient Danes were the uh, Danites, the tribe of Dan, if I'm correct, of the crescent and star borne by the followers of Mohammed, okay, and now retained by the Turkish Empire as its national device. So the Turkish people over there, they're not the um, original people in those lands. A lot of that mixture. Page 130, the emblem of life, ancient Shemitic races along um, with, uh, I can't even pronounce that word, but 
Symbolisms of heritage, right here. I thought this was quite interesting. The pine cone is stated by Count uh, de Evola to have been an emblem of life along the ancient Shemitic races, the same as was the uh, crux anista or key cross among the Egyptians. Okay, the cross is not associated with Christ. Okay. Um, I mean, I think that's been debunked so many times in other videos. I'm not going to get into that. Right here, the pomegranate. The pomegranate fruit is, according to uh, D. Evelyn, the symbol of fertility and abundance. And we know that it's also referenced to the, uh, the commandments because there's 613 laws, 613 seeds in the pomegranate fruit. Okay. It is born in the arms of uh, Grandi. And was used as a badge by Catherine of Aragon. Henry the Eighth bore this badge, impaled or divided with his own badge of a rose at various tournaments. As you can see right here, the ancient arms of France, a shield uh, strewn with lilies. The number of the uh, latter was afterwards reduced to three: the saints, Fleur de Lis. Nature knows no color line. This book never gets old, by the way. Uh, the Ancestress of George. I think that's the sixth of England. Queen Sophia. All right. Consort of George III. Grandmother of Queen Victoria. You see the Negroid features. Okay. Negroes and coat of arms of noble families, Wolfgang. Oh, these are all white people's names. Mm, no, they're not. Okay. You see the emblems, you see the name, German family. Right here. Negroes, coat of arms of noble families. This is in uh, German. Okay. This one is in Central Europe, okay? German families with Negro origin. Let's read a little bit right here. Some Negroes are undoubtedly the Moors or descendants of them who settled in Hamburg uh, after their expulsion from Spain in the 15th century, some of whom were wealthy. Another important fact as regard to these coat of arms, to be jet black and primitive in appearance, unlike our times, like today, was considered desirable. Therefore, Negroes, or those with a trace ancestry to them, had Negroes in their family crest. Again, more was once a symbol of power in all Europe. At a time when prowess and battle ranked first, the Moor had a reputation second to none. In England, says McRitchie, the blacks were not always in servitile race, or a servitile race, excuse me. And the Oxford Dictionary says, Black or Moor, now a nickname was formerly without uh, depreciatory force. As was says, Negroes, men and women wearing crowns and coronets appeared in British heraldry. And on the continent, some Negroes were not only favorites of royalty, but bore the family name of their kingly patreons, became founders of noble families. All right. Right here. German, the crowns, uh, archbishops, Mitris. Okay. Central Europe. Right here. See that? All right. And we have here uh, Montrez, uh, Montrez Harrell, if I'm pronouncing that right. But you see that? We got the uh, headband, hand wrap around his head. It was real popular a couple years ago, or more than a few years ago. But 
and got banned from the NBA. But, I mean, look at this. Same thing. Same thing. Right here. All right. Um, the Morels, Mark Morrison, the nose ring, the earrings, okay? Families with names of Negro origin, Holland, uh, Central, Middle, Portuguese, the other German. Same thing right here, Johan, close of arms, German Cardinal. German and Portugal. Did these look like slaves that were always uh, here? No, they were not. Let's see. Uh, arms of Aragon, Spain, Central Right. Arms of uh, Kimmersburg, Austria. Austria, St. Peter's, foremost saint and founder of the Catholic Church, is known as a or known as jet black negro okay let's see can't pronounce that word the black madonna and christ of alt alting um Beria. lowest left saint maurice in the coat of arms coatsburg germany all right othello that'll be another video Shakespeare was a brother, too. Um, let me see. Right here. Austria, Germany, Holland, Belgium. The Negro strand in the peoples of Northern Europe was already discussed in Volume 1, Sex and Race. To this, the following facts may be added. Most of the Negro strand in Northern Europe and Russia was taken in by the Jews, who, in spite of their religious prejudice against them, intermarried with Christians as Maurice Fishberg, in his uh, comprehensive study, a uh, Jew has shown and says Hertz, um, innumerable, innumerable uh, aristocrats have married Jewesses. As was said already, the ancient Jews who left Egypt must have been quite Negroid. 27. After mating with Egyptians and Ethiopians for centuries, they were probably even originally, Negroid. And there is no probability. They were Negroid. Abraham, according to the Bible, came from the year of the Chaldees. Chaldea was the seat of the Sumerian civilization, which was long considered to be white Aryan, and they was very wrong. The destruction of black civilization, right here. What I just read earlier, uh, part one. What became of the black people of Sumer? The traveler asked the old man, for ancient records show that the people of Sumer were black. What happened to them? Ah, the old man sighed. They lost their history, so they died, a Sumer legend. We so-called black people don't know our history, so we're dead in this society and everything else. But some of us are waking up to coming to the realization of who we are. Because in all reality, this is our book. This is our book. This is our history. Yes, it's been changed. Yes, there are contradictions in it. But there's not one contradiction about who the people are. Okay. And we know that we are the most highest people. And this is our history book. It's so evident in here. This is not a book about the world. Because the world only view us as so-called black people. That we're only slaves and we have no history. Or now they just want to lump us with ancestry. Oh, we're Nigerians. No. See, the Bible goes with seed lines. Europeans or Caucasians, they go by regions. See, we can trace our our uh, migration patterns and where we were at that specific time period. Okay. We may not have the names because there were illiteracy laws here in America. Okay. But 
overall, we can trace our history because this is our history. You know, this is not a white man's book. You know, just saying. But it was Negroid says, sparing in the childhood of art. The discovery, he says, was very disconcerting to uh, literary historians and uh, theologists for the race was proven to be not a branch of the civil Aryans nor of the gifted Shemites, but of a Negroid people having uh, affinities with Mongols. Okay. Um, it says, uh, if I'm pronouncing it right, also in his research says that the Emilites who once dominated in that region were Negroids or Negroid or Negroes. One of their kings is mentioned in a connection with Abraham in Genesis chapter 14. And yes, they all were Negroid people. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm not going to read all this. I think I read it in some other videos. But, you know, I mean, just so much evidence now. There's been evidence of who the real Shemitic peoples are, the real Israelites of the Bible. White and black Jews. Additional notes on Negro strand and Jews. Fishberg M., the Jew page, um, or I think it's uh, year 119, says the Negroid type of Jew is yet to be mentioned. I wonder why. One occasionally meets with a Jew whose skin is very dark and the hair black and woolly. Hmm, nappy headed, huh? The head long with a prominent um, occiput. The face is progenerous. Uh, the two jaws are projecting in the form of a muzzle. The lips are thick and upturned so that the nostrils can be seen in profile. The Negroid type can be singled out in any large assembly of Jews. They are often mistaken for mulattoes, and the author knows of one who had considerable difficulty to get along uh, in the southern states of America. He says certain biblical scholars are inclined to attribute the origin of the Negro type of Jews to intermarriage with Cushites of the biblical times and adds that the type is to be met with among Jews of Eastern Europe who have not come into contact with Negroes for centuries. Um, that's a lie. Uh, the Negro appearance of many Arabian and African Jews can be readily explained on the mixture with Negroes in those regions, but uh, that of the European type. No such explanation is tenable unless uh, it be a tribute to migration uh, from Southern Europe and uh, North Africa. In fact, many Jews driven from Spain and Portugal had settled along the European Jews may have had some Negroid elements which they obtained by intermarriage with the Moors who are known to have a considerable um, infusion of Negro blood. All right. Um, may the Negro traits such as dark skin, thick lips, progenitism, woolly hair, etc., which are often met with among the modern Jews, not be cases of ativism, okay, which means he reverts back to the original ancestor, which was a person of color. Okay, it reverts, it reverts back, well, the genetic structure reverts back to the, um, you know, the dominant gene. Not the recessive. Um, and long as other stuff too. Let me just showing you about the swartness of the blackness. Um, Jeremiah. I mean, this book, the Bible is written all about so-called people of color. I mean, people need to wake up. But when you stay, when you state some of this stuff, people think you're racist, even your own kind, because they're stiff neck, and then they're the dumb, deaf, and the blind, which the scriptures is talking about, because. It's so caught up in La La Land, you know, but it's out there. 